Um, let me get situated here. I'm just going to set this down. Well, hi, City Light South. My name is Dakota, and I serve as an elder um, here at City Light, and I'm excited to be here with you this morning. I'm glad everyone can make it in. It's a rainy, chilly morning. Pamela and I were talking on the way in of all the people who are running the Good Life Havesy this morning. We're impressed. And anybody in our church who's running and watching a delayed message, good job, because that sounds terrible. So (laughs) Um, today, what we're going to be doing is continuing with the Sermon on the Mount. But before we continue on, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the ability for brothers and sisters in Christ to gather. Thank you for the body of Christ to be here, to worship you, to sing praises to you, to sit under truth. And I pray this morning for each person that's in here that the distractions of the world can be left at the door. I pray for calm minds and clear consciences and clear hearts, Lord. And I pray that as we just walk through and continue on the Sermon on the Mount, that, um, yeah, your spirit is just moving. I pray, Lord, that the word can be just piercing our hearts, and I pray, God, that as we walk out today, there will be a greater love for you, and I pray, Lord, that there may be obedience in our lives, and we may be just living for everything for you and everything for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. So the text that we're going to be studying this morning is Matthew 6, 19 through 24. So if you have a Bible with you or if you use your app on your phone, go ahead and get there. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, and it's about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. Um, So while you're opening there, I'm just going to take a minute and kind of do a quick overview of today's content. To kind of summarize it in one sentence, it's this. Today's message is going to cover what Jesus has to say about money, possessions, and treasures. Everyone's favorite things to talk about, right? Right? And thank you for giving me the text and letting me have the time to study and sit in it and dwell. But the reality is, these topics are often pretty cringy and can be quite uncomfortable to discuss in church. And I'm thinking that if we gave a poll or a survey to everyone in the room today, more than likely you've either had an experience in your own life or read something somewhere about corruption in a church with regards to money. And that could be a fire and brimstone preacher who is driving guilt and getting the congregation to give out of obligation. Or maybe you were watching Christian TV or a YouTube video and saw this televangelist who said, hey, God wants for you more than anything health, wealth, and prosperity, which is a lie. Or maybe you've seen or been a part of a church where a priest or a pastor or a minister has been a part of some sort of embezzlement problem, and that goes public and everything starts to blow up. And the reality is, there have been instances inside of church buildings in the past where there's been corruption. And sadly, I can guarantee you there will be more problems to come in the future. Because the reality is, we as humans are sinful, and there are people in church buildings who are not there because they love Jesus, but because they are there for their own selfish gain. So, in light of the fact that that there has been problems of corruption in the past, I want to start this morning by giving you three assurances as we head into Matthew 6, 19 through 24. The first assurance is this. This is not a random text that was chosen to cherry pick and talk about money and giving. For the last seven, eight weeks, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, and we've covered a wide range of topics, right? We've talked about blessedness. We've talked about salt and light, murder, divorce, oaths, on and on and on. And today, we just happen to get to the part where Jesus addresses money And he addresses the heart that he wants for his people in it. Second assurance, this sermon is not an effort to bolster the church budget. It is not an effort to raise funds for a building addition. And it's not an effort to to give big Christmas bonuses to all the people on staff. I am not here this morning to have your wallets opened up and emptied and to wring you dry. That's not why I'm here. And the third assurance is this. This text matters. Matthew 6, 19 through 24, just like everywhere else in Scripture, is God-breathed, it is perfect, and it is unchanging. And the reality is Jesus Christ spoke these words over 2,000 years ago, and they still carry the same exact weight today. In Hebrews, it says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. 
Each of the last seven Sundays for the Sermon on the Mount, we have seen how Christ dives down into the heart and says that he wants it. And today, that's absolutely no different. Jesus does not want us to give because it makes us stand right before him. He does not want us to be generous because it makes us better than the person sitting to your left or sitting to your right. But Jesus calls us to put our treasure in him because he's worth it. He wants our heart and our desire to be for him. Because he was so generous for us on the cross and that he gave everything for us, we should live as a church open-handed in response and giving every component of our life to him. And the main point of today's message is this. Jesus wants to know what your treasure is. And by walking through Matthew 6, 19 through 24, each person sitting in the room today here at City Light South is going to find out where your treasure is at. Jesus helps us discover this question, where this treasure is at, by addressing three topics. First, he wants to know, what does your heart desire? Second, where is your focus? And three, who do you serve? So once again, we're going to look at one, what does your heart desire? Two, where is your focus? And three, who do you serve? With that, let's go into scripture. We'll get verses 19 to 21 and ask the question, what does your heart desire? Starting in verse 19. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So let's pause and let's jump back in time and imagine that we are the disciples sitting at Jesus' feet 2,000 years ago. I want you to picture sitting and looking up at Jesus, and then you look down at your feet and you see the sandals that are very different than the shoes you have on your feet today, right? Imagine looking at the clothes, once again, very different than what you're wearing this morning in church. Think about the sweat pouring down your head because air conditioning does not exist. Imagine having to go and hunt for food, gather your water, collect materials on a day-to-day basis because plumbing, refrigeration, heating, electricity, none of that stuff is out there. And you may be wondering, all right, why did we just paint this picture? Why did we just try to figure out, all right, what would it be like to be sitting in front of Jesus? And the reason is this. In order to understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6, we need, we need to know who he's saying it to. So people in first century Israel did not have humidity-controlled areas to prevent rust. They didn't even have enclosed spaces that would prevent bugs from getting in and destroying stuff. And in verse 19, Jesus is, is, is warning his disciples not to store up their treasures on earth because the reality for them was moths would get in and destroy their things. Rust would come and it would destroy the metals that they owned, and thieves would steal. People in first century, century Israel valued very types, various types of metals because it was their currency, like a denarius. And the reality is that piece of material would rust over time. And they also valued things such as linens and cloth and silk, et cetera, et cetera. And those things would be eaten by moths. Jesus is directly telling his disciples that if left alone, their money will eventually rust. Those linens and silk and cloth they have for status and clothing will be eaten. And the bottom line is this. There is no eternal value in those possessions. Jesus is not saying that having money is bad or owning earthly possessions is evil, and we know that from other areas of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 6.10, Paul writes and says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Possessions in themselves are not bad, and that applies to us today. We can have a phone, we can have a car, we can have these various things, a nice watch, whatever. But the problem really comes in when the love of money is consuming us down to the heart level. And in context, Christ's dire warning to his disciples is that their hope, their treasure, cannot be found in their possessions of the world because those possessions will fade. And the reality is this same problem exists for us today. If left untouched, our houses will crumble, our cars will break down, they'll slowly rust over time, and our possessions will fade. And I was doing some research this week, and if you could put the picture up on the, on the slide back here, there was um, a guy who was pretty well known in the world in the 80s, and he basically had all these various properties. There we go. 
and he ran into some financial issues, and what happened is he ended up having to sell his house. The guy who bought it ended up not being able to occupy it or whatever. So basically for the last like 35 years, this house has been sitting here untouched. And what do you notice in that picture? You've got windows that are broken out, the siding looks terrible, there's other angles online that show the roof is like caving in in various areas, the vegetation's overgrowing, there's probably raccoons and all sorts of animals that live inside of there. But that possession is fading. Go ahead and go to the next slide as well. Now, I'm not gonna pretend to know anything about cars, so I think these cars are generically similar in nature. <laughs> but on that top picture, you see something that's restored, nice, beautiful, and then a similar car that's also blue is in the bottom picture, and that car has been sitting in a field or in a barn or whatever, and we all get the point, right? If left untouched, things will fade. And the promise that Jesus gave or the warning that Jesus gave over 2,000 years ago is still true today. There is no eternal value for us, City Light South, in our earthly possessions. And our hope cannot be in them because surely they will fade. Now, City Light South, it's really easy for us to look at the picture of the abandoned car or the abandoned house and think, all right, that makes sense. If I leave my house untouched for 30 years, it's gonna look terrible. And if I have a car that... Well, no matter what you do with the car, it's going to break down. It's going to have issues over time. So note to self, do not put my hope in my house or in my car. All right, I'm set, good to go. But what I'd like to do is challenge each of us to really take a more inward look and think about and investigate the areas of temptation where we tend to place our treasures. What are those weak spots in your individual life where you are tempted to treasure and hope in earthly possessions? So for me, a lot of it honestly centers around Amazon. My wife, Pamela, and I, we budget every month, and we set, set aside a certain amount of money that's discretionary spend or fund money. So no questions asked, no judgment. We can see, spend it as we see fit as long as it's God-glorifying. But if I wanted to, I could walk out of here today, go to Walmart, and buy 45 Snickers bars with that spend money. Is it a good idea? No. Pamela would probably make fun of me. I might gain five pounds, but I could do that because that's how our discretionary spend money works. I was telling Citigroup earlier this week that I have a list on my phone of things I'd like to buy over time with this spend money. This month, it might be some sort of golf gadget. Next month, maybe I get a new watch. I've been looking at Bluetooth headphones for a while, so maybe I'll get something there. But what I have found over time is this. When I make that purchase each month, and it's typically from Amazon, it's not satisfying in the slightest. Normally, I make the purchase, and before the package has even arrived, two days later, or in today's time, four to eight days later, <laughs> but before that package even comes, my focus is already onto the next month of what I can get. So I'm thinking, all right, what's gonna be satisfying for me next month? And the reality is, it never does satisfy. So what is it for you? Is it feeling like you need to have the new iPhone or the new Pixel if you're on Team Android? Is it, is it a desire to have the nicest, newest looking car in the neighborhood even though you just got one a couple years ago? Or maybe it's having the nicest lawn in the neighborhood like our pastor Alex over here. <laughs> <laughs> and for the record, I cleared that with him beforehand. So. <laughs> so while these things may not be bad to have, they cannot be our treasure, and they cannot be our hope. The phone will die in a couple years, the car will start to break down, it'll look out of style, and Alex's precious lawn will get a fungus and it will die and things will go upside down. <laughs> but in reality, City Lights Out, our earthly possessions cannot be where we place our treasures. So based on verse 19, if we are not supposed to put our treasures on earth, where are we supposed to place them? Let's look at verses 20 and 21 again to see what Jesus says. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. Jesus answers the question and says that our treasures are supposed to be in heaven. And that that is the best investment of our treasures because in heaven they will not rust they will not be destroyed, they will not fade, 
They will not be stolen. They will not be come crumbling down when the stock market crashes. They will not be swindled by irresponsible people or irresponsible businesses. But our treasures in heaven will be eternal. So you're probably thinking, all right, this seems a little bit ridiculous to God. I know what you're saying, but what does it actually mean to invest those treasures in heaven? Because there's not a bank down the street that's, that's called Heaven's Bank where you go set up a savings account, put your money in there every month, you get a little bit of interest. Like that doesn't exist, right? So what does it mean for us as a church, City Light South, to put our investments eternally in heaven? And what I would like to do is provide two examples. And these examples are based off of Scripture and what I see that God values in Scripture. So first, store up your treasures in heaven by investing in the local church. And throughout the early church and New Testament, what we see is that one of the main locomotives God uses for the expansion of, the, of his kingdom and for the proclamation of his gospel is the local church. Through the local church, saints are built up, equipped, and sanctified. Ephesians 4. Missionaries are sent to take the gospel to unreached people groups all over the world. We see that in the book of Acts. Widows are cared for, Acts 6. People come to faith, Acts 2, Acts 8, and many, many other places in Scripture. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And this is not a special designation just for the, the churches that we see in the Bible, but we see these very things happening in City Light South today. Our congregation is fed the word every week and being challenged and encouraged to walk with Jesus, to grow with him, and to live for him in all that we do. Currently, City Lights Out is working to partner with an overseas church so we can build a long-term relationship with them and walk alongside them in reaching unreached people groups. There are stories of people being fed, items being bought, provisions being made when times are tough. And there are people sitting in this room today who two years ago did not know Jesus. And by God's grace, he has used City Light South and the word and his spirit to open their eyes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to be really clear here and just take a step back. I mean, I want to be really, really clear. God does not need our money for any of this to happen. But what we see in Matthew 6 is that he does want our heart. He wants our treasure to be in him, and therefore, our treasure should be in his local church as well. So if City Light South is your home church, and this is your spiritual family, I have to ask the question, are you investing your treasures in the work God is doing here at City Light South? And if the answer to that is no, why don't you? The local church is an eternal investment, which is what we've already dug through and seen, while the things of this world are, are short-lived and will surely fade. So if this is your home church, you are agreeing that you want to see Jesus-centered disciples being built up and churches being multiplied and sent out. And this is the lens in which we do everything at City Light. It's the lens in which we build our church budget. It's the lens in which we made our mission statement. It's the lens in which every major decision that happens for this church Partnering with us at City Light South is not just a cause to give money because it saves you or it makes you a better Christian, but you are partnering with City Light South because God is carrying out his mission here by multiplying Jesus-centered disciples and churches, and it is surely an eternal investment. So my encouragement for you today is to start giving. It might be hard at first, especially if you're living beyond your means or if money is really tight in your household. But luckily, God's desire is not for you to hit a certain percentage of what you are given. What he wants, and we see this in Corinthians, is he wants people to be cheerful and joyful in giving to the work that he is doing. And to kind of peel the curtain back and share about my own household, Pamela and I give a certain amount of our income every month to City Light South. And on the second day, guaranteed to happen second day because of the email every month, money goes from my bank account or our bank account to the church. And the reason we choose to do this early in the month is because we want God to have the first fruits of what he has given us in our paychecks. And in essence, what we are saying to God is thank you for the provisions you've given us. And out of thankfulness and appreciation for Christ's generosity to us in a spiritual sense, here is our eternal investment in the local church. We know God and we trust you that you will use this money for your kingdom. So, 
Maybe for you, today is the day to give for the first time and to start putting your eternal investment in God's work that he's doing here at City Light South. In addition to giving, I think we can also say that personal conduct is an example of storing up our treasures in heaven. Personal holiness, battling sin, the fruits of the Spirit, such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, are all eternal investments that will not return void for us. Think of Matthew 5, 16, which we covered about like a month ago here in church. And it says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Investing in our personal conduct and living for God in all that we do displays Christ's love to others and is a testimony of the transformation that he has done and completed in our lives. City Light South, in order to be growing in our personal conduct, growing in our holiness, growing and living in God, we must spend time in the word. We must spend time in prayer. We must spend time in community, and we must be begging God to be removing the old part of us and putting on the new because he will use it for his kingdom, he will use it for his glory, and it will be an eternal investment, investment that does not return void. Let's continue on looking at verses 22 to 23 and looking at the next question that Jesus starts to investigate. Where is your focus? Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, but your whole, bo- if your eye is healthy your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? So not going to lie, at first glance, this section can be pretty confusing. And I've spent quite a bit of time over the last couple weeks trying to make sure I understood what Christ is saying here and why it matters. And what I think we tend to do with these two verses, because they, they seem super random in there, right? What we tend to do is we tend to pluck them out from the Sermon on the Mount, then start to make general applications about them. So we say, all right, if we look at things that are good, the inside of us will be good. If we look at things that are bad or evil, the inside of us will be bad or evil. So mental note, look at things that are good, which is pretty subjective. (laughs) Don't look at things that are bad and evil. However, whenever we study scripture, and in this case, just a couple verses, we always want to be looking at the things that happened before the text and after the text. That way we have a true understanding of what the context is. So let's just do that quick. Immediately before this passage, in verses 19 through 21, Jesus is telling his disciples, we just covered this, right? To put their treasures above in heaven and not on earth. His concern is that the heart and that his disciples' treasures are, are centered up here on heaven. Now let's jump to verse 24, which we haven't gotten to yet, so a little sneak peek for you. Jesus' prime concern in this section is that his disciples serve God, once again, and not money. He wants their affection, their heart, their heart, and their life to be given to God. So knowing this, let's jump back into 22 and 23 here. And what we can conclude that in context, Jesus' main point and concern in these verses is that his disciples are focused on the right thing. After all, in order for his disciples to store up their treasures in heaven, they need to have a heavenward focus that looks to Jesus on the regular. In order for his disciples to serve God over money, they need to set their gaze uh, um, above on God and remember continually his beauty and his magnificence. The eye that we see here in verse 22 is healthy when it is looking to heaven for our treasure and for our hope. And conversely, the eye in verse 23 is bad or it is unhealthy if it is looking below at the earthly things. When our focus is set on storing our treasures on earth and serving money, our affections and our desire for God will be smothered. When our focus is set above, our affections to to store up our treasures and live for Jesus will will flourish and will be fruitful and frequent. So here's an analogy that might help us build a picture of verses 22 and 23. And this analogy comes from Coach Brown um, at the Huskers, who I've had the pleasure of listening to and meeting a couple times. So this is completely from him. It's not my original idea. (laughs) But um, what Coach Brown likes to do is he likes to compare the Christian life to a football field. So imagine being on offense, and you're sitting back on your one-yard line, and you stare out, and about 100 yards away, you see these goalposts up in the air. 
Now, as an offense, your objective is to get the football all the way down the field to where those goalposts are located in the end zone. And in order for the offense to do their job well, they need to be looking up, scanning, looking ahead, finding the right receiver, hitting the right hole, et cetera, but they must be looking forward in what they're doing. Now, let's draw this as a parallel over to the Christian life. Imagine that you're staying on the one-yard line of your walk with Jesus, and you look down, and instead of goalposts, you see a big cross sitting at the end of that end zone. Just like football, we're moving each day. Some days forward, some days backward, some days we stumble, some days we have a 30-yard reception. But each day, what we're doing is we're moving closer and closer to the point when Jesus takes us up to be his own. But think about the Christian life. If we're like that offense, or we're looking up, setting our gaze on Jesus, it's going to be easier to run at him, to store up our treasures for him, and to live for him in all that we do. But if you're an offensive football team, and you say hike, and then you stare at the floor, and you run around, is that ever going to work? No, you're never going to get one play that works well. You're going to have a lot of turnovers, a lot of problems. And the same thing is true for us as Christians. If we proverbially hike the ball, and then all we do is we stare down below at all the things the earth has to give us, it's going to be so difficult for us to, to store up our treasures for God, to live for him and serve him in all that we do. And if all we do all the time is, store up, is look down at the earth and look at the treasures that are here, there might be some sort of concern that maybe our gaze and our affection isn't truly for Jesus, but instead it's for the things that are here that are temporary and will be fade. And in principle, we all know that this is true. If you're sitting at home and you purchase your fifth Amazon, Amazon item for the day, or you take multiple hours scrolling through social media, or you binge watch Netflix for half the day, you often feel pretty agitated, you feel bitter, and you're difficult to be around. Your affections are not for God, but they're often for others. And when we fix our eyes on the world and we store our treasures here, it's easy for us to serve money, serve our status, and serve ourselves rather than the king. So City, City Light South, how can we fix our eyes above each day and focus on Jesus and be reminded of him? This week at City Group, we're having a pretty great discussion about this topic, and one of the women in our group pointed out that the best way for her to focus on Christ was to be in the Word and to be in prayer each and every day. And she was sharing how she could feel agitated or jealous or longing for earthly treasures or status when there was an extended amount of time away from the Bible. So, one critical application for us to fix our eyes on Christ is this. Spend time regularly in scripture and in prayer. Spend time alone with the Lord so that your gaze is set on him. A few other applications that I'll just kind of hit at a high level that will help us focus on Christ. And some of these we talked about this weekend at the men's retreat. Memorizing scripture. I challenge each of us to just do one verse a week. If that's too much, one verse a month. But you'll have 12 verses in the back of your mind at the end of the year, or 52 if you do once a week. But memorizing scripture keeps it on the forefront of our minds and allows us to be thinking of it and sharing it with others. Another example, set an hourly reminder on your phone or on your watch to think about God. Think about the scripture you read this morning. Think about the thing God has been convicting and calling you to. Think about the people you're interacting in, that, in those moments who don't know Jesus and need to know him. A third example, set specific prayer times through your day. Particular people who are disciplined, have a lot of rhythms built into their life, right? They wake up at five, they go work out at the gym, then they eat this particular food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do the same thing with your prayer life. Set those times during the day when you're driving to work, when you're driving home, when you're eating lunch, when you're with your family at night. Set up those prayer times where you're, you're pausing, you're looking to Jesus, giving thanks, and going to him in intercession. City Light South, let's focus on Christ and see him as our treasure and our master. And finally today, let's turn to verse 24 and look at the last question that we proposed at the beginning. Who do you serve? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters since he, he will either hate one and love the other or he'll be de devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The last area Jesus leans into with his disciples is he wants to know where they're, where their devotion and their services. 
He digs down, he presses in, and says the heart can only serve one exclusive master, and it must be God. And to understand this a little better, I would like to look at the word serve that we see here in verse 24 a couple times. So I know very little about Greek, but the word that is in Greek for serve here is deluo, which means to be a slave, serve, do service, or being in bondage. And this is similar to another word that we frequently see in the Bible, which is doulos. Doulos means a slave, bondman, man of servile condition. And the reason I share this with you this morning is that the apostles often use this exact word to describe themselves in their relationship to Christ. For example, Romans 1.1, Paul, a bondservant or a slave or doulos of Christ Jesus. James 1. James, a bondservant of God. Philippians 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. 2 Peter, Simon Peter, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Jude, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting to read this because these men were opening up their letters to the church and proclaiming that they were in complete bondage, complete servitude to Jesus Christ. There was no compromise There was no split interest. There was not a day off for them. The apostles saw how much Christ had given for them, and in response, they called themselves servants to Jesus. Because he gave up so much and paid the price for their right standing with God, they wanted to give everything they had to him and use every aspect of their life for his name, for his mission, and for his glory. So knowing this about serve, let's read verse 24 again and note, these, these words, no one can serve two masters since he will hate one and love the other, or he will be, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And Jesus is very black and white in this section. There's no gray area where money can be served from Monday to Friday, and then God gets the service on Saturday or Sunday. Jesus says the kingdom person, his disciple, will have the heart to serve him or they will have the heart to serve money. In the Western church, we have this tendency to marry the two together. We'll say, yes, God is our master, but it's also okay for us to do everything in our power to get the next promotion, get the next house, the next car, the next pay raise, and prioritize those goals above everything spiritual, our family's spiritual health, our lost neighbor, our own spiritual well-being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. God tends to be more of an accessory that we put on the suit jacket, an accessory pin on our suit jacket than he is the whole of our life. And I think what's most, the most intimidating part of this text is that only the individual knows who their heart serves. It is impossible for me to know the heart of anyone else except for myself. I cannot even truly know the heart of my own wife or my son or others who are close to me. Now, I have 99.9999999% confidence level of where my wife is and who she loves and who she serves. But the reality is I don't even know her deepest motives and what she does. So here are a few diagnostic questions that might help reveal who you serve. And remember that Jesus says we can only serve one. We can either serve God or we can serve money. So question one, does your job, your next promotion, the house you live in, or the car that you drive dictate every decision in your life? If so, money might be your master. Question two, does your work and desire for income take priority over all spiritual components of your life? Church attendance, fellowship in the body, involvement in a city group, personal spiritual disciplines, or family discipleship? If so, money might be your master. Question three, do you invest any money into the kingdom of God? And once again, if the answer is no, money might be your master. Question four, and I think most importantly, Have there been seasons in your life where you have loved to serve God, where you find great joy in living for him 
loving him, giving thanks to him for Jesus, and desiring to spend time with him. And if there's never been a time you can point to in your life where there has been a love and an affection for Jesus and for serving him, God may not be your master. So as a response to these questions, I'd like to address three groups of people in the room. First, if you're sitting here right now and you've got red flags going off and you're thinking in your mind, okay, maybe God is not my master. Maybe I don't love him. Maybe I've never served him a day in my life. And I'm actually really concerned sitting here right now. My ask, my plea, and my hope for you is that you would turn from your sin and your disobedience and that you would run to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the good news of Jesus is this. He did live that perfect life. He died the death that you deserved. He paid the penalty for sin, and he has defeated death, making a way for the broken sinner to be made right and stand before God. Jesus took the penalty for the sin that you deserved, and he gave his perfection to those who will put their faith in him. His perfection allows you to stand without blemish before God the Father. So if you are this person today, I would encourage you and really request and plea that you may forsake the life you once lived, the sin that you once loved that you would turn from, and today that you would go to Jesus. You would put your full trust in him and his finished work on the cross. His grace is sufficient for you. The next person I'd like to address is the believer in the room who's sitting here feeling discouraged and feeling down and out right now. You might be thinking, I do love God, and I know Christ paid for my sins, but I think my focus in this season has been on serving money and placing my treasures here on earth. And my words for you are to remember the cross of Christ and the blood spilled for you at Calvary. Colossians 1.22 says, He, being Jesus, has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Christ's reconciliation is full and final for those who trust in him. 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believer, turn to God and receive his forgiveness and his cleansing that comes through the blood of Jesus. Go out today knowing that you are covered in Christ and in response, strive to store your treasures in heaven. Serve God in all that you do and remember that you are blameless because of Jesus. And finally, I'd like to address the believer in the room who's in a joyous, sweet season of storing up your treasures in heaven and serving God. My call to you is to be thankful and to rejoice. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Remember that it is not your goodness that has brought victory in these areas, but it is God's goodness and what he has done for you. I'm struck when I read scripture and see Paul's constant attitude of humility, and what he's doing is he's modeling Jesus as well. Believer, keep pursuing God in humility, and keep this passage in the back of your pocket for that, that season in life where it is going to be difficult to store up your treasures in heaven and to serve God in what you do. Remember that our generosity and our giving is out of response of the ultimate generosity Christ displayed for us on the cross. With that, let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray, God, um, yeah, just for the heart for myself and also for everyone here in the building this morning. I pray, Lord, that... Um, you may just stir up an affection, Lord, for our treasures to be set on you. And I pray, Lord, just for obedience for myself and for our church, that we may serve you and love you more than the things of this earth. I know, Lord, that you do not need my money. You do not need my financial contributions or the other people in this church to do your will. But I know that you want my heart. And I pray, Lord, for each of us that our heart posture is just so overwhelming in love with you that we are willing to give anything, our comfort, our security, our house, anything, Lord, pales in comparison to you. I pray, Lord, that as we go out this week, that you may be just stirring in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that um, we may be living for you in all that we do and that ultimately you are glorified.